Hey guys, we are now at the end of period six in the APUSH curriculum. Topic 6.13 is our last look at this period, and uh, it's covering politics in the Gilded Age. And uh, there's a lot of stuff to cover in this particular topic, so uh, I apologize if the video is a little bit longer than uh, our normal ones. All right, so we're going to focus in this topic on this guiding question, how were political parties shaped by the Gilded Age? And uh, let's begin by talking a little bit about corruption. So, you know, American uh, Americans like to um, often complain about the government and, you know, both sides claim that the other side is corrupt and so forth. And the Gilded Age is really known as kind of the golden age of political corruption. It was a time period where political machines were extremely powerful. Um, and, and if you're not sure what a political machine is, basically it's a political organization um, led by a person they would usually refer to as a boss. And he may or may not even be an elected official. He might just be a private individual or maybe he is actually in government somewhere. And basically he is the one who has this um, a hierarchy of political supporters underneath him and he makes all the decisions and everyone in this organization answers to him it's it's almost like a kind of like a mafia type situation where you have like the you know the guy at the top and you have these different layers of people at the bottom um, and they really determine uh, who is going to run for office um, they would often uh, rig elections buy off candidates and so forth and so they really were uh, <laughs> deciding what happened in the political sphere. So uh, obviously a political machine is not very democratic. Now, in addition to the political machines, um, you would see things like stock market manipulation going on in the Gilded Age. So maybe uh, people would use insider information uh, to benefit themselves. Uh, on the stock market, or maybe they could do things like try to drive the price down of a particular stock so they could buy it more cheaply. Um, they could water down stock. I mean, there's all kinds of different techniques and things they could use. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, they're probably breaking all kinds of laws and rules doing this, and certainly they were, but again, this is the golden age of corruption, so if you had enough money and enough influence, um, chances are you could buy off a judge, you could buy off a jury, you could even bribe legislatures to make laws or to suspend laws or just kind of do your bidding. And uh, we can see the influence of big business on politics in this great political cartoon. So we've got this guy right here. Notice he's got the whip. It says coercion. We're going to coerce these people. And his pocket says monopolist. So we can assume he's probably in charge of some big trust or factory or something. And his factory workers there, you can see they're in shackles. They're marching in lockstep. And they're being threatened with discharge. That is to say being fired if they're not voting a particular way. Now, there were political machines on really in all levels of government. Um, the big cities of America all had a political machine. Uh, but the most infamous of these political machines was the one that ran uh, democratic politics in New York City. And this political machine was called Tammany Hall or the Tweed Ring. And it's called the Tweed Ring because the boss, William Boss Tweed. And he had an absolute iron grip on politics in New York City. Uh, I mean, nobody got elected without his permission, basically. Um, I mean, he controlled everything. He's the big puppet master behind the scenes. And he's bribing people. He's defrauding people. Uh, he's, he's stealing tons of money from the city coffers. Uh, we, we estimate he sold, stole something upwards of $200 million uh, during his career. Now, you know, everyone knew that Boss Tweed was up to, to no good. And most people, of course, were paid off to look the other way or uh, to just not enforce the rules. And so it was up to journalists to try to bring him down. And a famous uh, political cartoonist named Thomas Nast uh, made a lot of headway in this area. He would uh, draw some political cartoons that were just attacking uh, Tweed's corruption 
and other people's com uh, you know complicit nature in this whole uh, political machine. And I'll show you some of those cartoons in a second. And ultimately, what's going to happen is Tweed is eventually going to be sent to prison. Um, he's going to escape from prison, and he'll be recaptured in Spain. And the story goes that one of the reasons he was able to be captured in Spain is because of Thomas Nast's famous cartoons meant that uh, Boss Tweed's face was one of the most famous in the world, so it was kind of hard for him to hide. So a couple of Nast cartoons, and you can see, again, there's Boss Tweed here, and here he is, and his head is just a sack of money, and here he is uh, controlling the votes. By the way, Thomas Nast also is responsible for uh, the elephant being the symbol of the Republican Party. He was the first to actually draw the Republicans as an elephant. All right, our next big scandal involves the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Remember, in the Transcontinental Railroad, there were two railroads. One was called the Central Pacific, one was called the Union Pacific, and they were working kind of towards the middle. And the Union Pacific in particular, was known for some very shady business practices. And so Union Pacific executives came to the conclusion that they're not going to make, make any money off of building a railroad because you're building a railroad into nowhere. You're losing money, in effect. Um, and so they, they had to find some way to kind of line their pockets. And what they did is they created a phony construction company called Credit Mobilier. And Credit Mobilier would be hired by the Union Pacific to build the Union Pacific for the Union Pacific. And this company, Credit Mobilier, would charge just crazy inflated prices to build the railroad. And that way, the Union Pacific could always go to the government, ask for more money, more loans, uh, more subsidies to say, hey, we don't have enough money to pay the construction uh, of this railroad. And so it was seen as kind of almost like a blank check that uh, they could send money from the government to Credit Mobilier, and then that would go into the pockets of Union Pacific executives because they're the ones who owned Credit Mobilier stock. Now, this, of course, is incredibly scandalous because what we're doing is we're basically defrauding the federal government of money uh, by overspending on the construction of the railroad. So to keep this um, quiet, many politicians, and in fact, even the vice president at the time, were given stock in Credit Mobilier so they could share in the profits from this very, very shady uh, investment scheme. Now, this today would be a, an incredibly big scandal, and it was a big scandal even back then, but just to show you that politicians were uh, rarely punished for this kind of stuff, nobody ever went to prison for this huge defrauding of the federal government. All right, our second big topic today is going to be something called the patronage system and also something called civil service reform. Now, to understand patronage, we need to go back and think about Andrew Jackson's spoils system. Remember, in the spoils system, uh, what you would do is if you won an election, you would reward people who had supported you in that campaign with jobs in the government. And we talked about how it had some upsides and a whole lot of downsides patronage, or excuse me, the spoils system had. And as we get into this late 1800s period, um, we're going to change the name from spoil system to patronage. It's the same process, though. You're handing out jobs to those who are politically loyal to you. <clears throat> now, because of the potential for uh, corruption and scandal, not everybody was on board with patronage. And in fact, this is a, an issue that divided the Republican Party. On one wing of the Republican Party were called the Stalwarts, and they were led by a senator from New York named Roscoe Conkling, a, one of the more powerful uh, senators in, in American history. And he thought that there was nothing wrong with patronage, that this is just the way the politics works. It's totally fine to trade votes for jobs. You know, what's wrong with that? On the other side of the Republican Party, you had a group called the Half-Breeds, and the Half-Breeds were against this patronage system, again, because of its potential for scandal and corruption, and they were calling for what's known as civil service reform. That is to say, we're going to reform this process of giving out jobs in the government to take the politics out of it. Now, this was a debate, again, between those two sides of the Republican Party, 
But it was a debate that just kind of hung in the balance. It, it wasn't really going anywhere until July of 1881. On July 2nd, 1881, President James A. Garfield was shot and killed by a deranged office seeker named Charles Guiteau. You see him there. There's uh, Guiteau being kind of wrestled, and uh, you can see uh, Garfield's been shot in the back. And it turned out that the reason Guiteau had shot Garfield was he had, in Garfield's campaign to be elected, Charles Guiteau had written a, a speech in support of Garfield's candidacy. And it was, it was one of these, you know, minor speeches that didn't really do anything. I don't, I don't think it changed a single vote. But Charles Guiteau had convinced himself, because frankly, he's crazy, um, that he, like, personally res was responsible for Garfield's election. So he would show up at the White House repeatedly, like, demanding jobs. He wanted to be the ambassador to other countries and, and he was just a big fat nuisance. And eventually they told him to get lost. You know, we're not going to give you a job. And so this, prompted Guteau then to seek revenge by killing um, Garfield. Uh, by the way, Garfield, or excuse me, Guteau was, again, straight up crazy. And in fact, they actually preserved uh, his brain, or at least part of his brain. And uh, it's actually on display at a museum in Philadelphia. If you really want to go see an assassin's brain, go check it out. Now, President Garfield has been killed by this crazy office seeker who had been, you know, really just caught up in the whole patronage system. So what effect is this going to have on the patronage system? And obviously the effect is we've got to do something about this. We've got to do something to reel in this patronage system before other people are killed as well. And so what comes out of this is called the Pendleton Act of 1883. This establishes something called the Civil Service Commission. And what the Civil Service Commission does is it appoints these federal jobs not on the base of the basis of who you voted for, or who you campaigned for, or who your father is, or whatever, but rather on the basis of competitive exams. So in other words, people are going to compete for these jobs, and the best candidate will get the job. Now, this didn't apply to all jobs in the federal government initially, um, but it's a step in the right direction. And this is how we fill a lot of federal jobs even today. All right, now we're going to get into some of the big, big political issues of the Gilded Age. And these political issues are really not political issues of the modern day. So politics have changed quite a bit. So let's look at what really drove politics in the Gilded Age. And one of the big topics that were that was constantly being debated was the tariff. And the two parties, Republicans and Democrats, were split on the tariff. The Republicans had been known as the high tariff party uh, all the way since the Civil War. And, and their theory was high tariffs protect industry, right? It, it causes Americans to buy American goods because foreign goods now are more expensive. Democrats, however, they favored tariff reform, which means lowering the tariff um, and, in theory, easing perhaps some of the burden on consumers who now can purchase cheaper foreign goods. And you can see the tariff, how it climbs dramatically after the Civil War, and then it does start to creep down and dips quite a bit, and then it jumps again during the Great Depression, and today it's, I mean, almost, I won't say it's non-existent, but it's pretty close to non-existent compared to where it used to be. All right, the other big issue that drove politics in the late 1800s was, of all things, currency. And there were basically, again, two camps. On one side, you had people who favored what's known as soft money. And soft money refers to inflation, right? You're going to put a lot of paper and uh, paper currency into circulation. You're going to coin lots of silver and gold dollars to get more and more money into circulation because, again, this benefits farmers and debtors. But investors and bankers and businessmen, they didn't like that because inflation is bad for business. They preferred hard money, which means the gold standard. You only have as much money in circulation as you have gold to back that up. This brings us to a really important election in American history. It's the election of 1896. Now think back to the last big turning point presidential election we've studied. And if you're thinking back, you'll probably eventually arrive at a, a 19, excuse me, 1860 with the election of President Lincoln. 
And that tells you for almost 40 years, there really weren't any big presidential elections because the parties, while they differed on this and that, um, presidents tended to be very weak in the Gilded Age. It really was um, the era of a strong Congress and a weak presidency. It, it, some people even refer to the Gilded Age as the era of the forgotten president. But that's going to come to an end in 1896. Let's look at the two candidates on the Republican side. We've got William McKinley of Ohio. And he, as a good Republican, he's going to run on the hard money ticket, that is to say pro-gold standard, and he wants nice protective tariffs. Again, solid Republican platform from the Gilded Age. Now, now, what else McKinley has going for him is he comes from a very politically powerful state, Ohio, which has produced lots of presidents and has decided a lot of presidential elections. He also has a distinguished military career. He was a Civil War veteran. He also has a great campaign team around him. Uh, a fellow Ohioan named Marcus Alonzo Hanna was uh, the guy kind of orchestrating this campaign who's going to get uh, McKinley uh, nominated and then ultimately elected. Now, on the Democratic side, um, there was a lot of debate on what to do. There wasn't really that, that solid, let's choose this guy kind of thing. They were kind of floundering around, couldn't decide. They, they came to the conclusion that they didn't want to see Cleveland go for a third term. They knew that much. But who would fill his position? And then, yeah, as this convention is going on, people are giving speeches. Um, a 36-year-old from Nebraska took to the stage to give a speech. His name was William Jennings Bryan. And we are going to use that name a lot in the next couple of uh, weeks and months. So just keep in mind, William Jennings Bryan, we're going to mention that name a lot. So he gives a speech, and it's one of the more famous political speeches of all time. It's known as the Cross of Gold speech. And the reason it's called the Cross of Gold speech is the last line of his speech said, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. And what that's a reference to is his desire to break the gold standard by inflating the currency. And the term for this, they, they called it free silver, which means, again, you're going to coin lots of silver currency to inflate uh, the money supply to um, help out debtors and farmers. And this speech resonated with the Democrats. In fact, they literally, they carried them off the stage on their arms, almost like a, a coach winning the Super Bowl or something. And he wins the nomination. And uh, there he is given a speech, and there's his cross of gold. Now, let's think about this for a second. This is going to be a really obvious question. Which is more valuable, gold or silver? And obviously, it's gold, right? So here is how the Democrats plan to inflate the currency. What they're going to do is they're going to put silver coins, silver dollar coins, into circulation. Now, the ratio they're going to use is 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. Well, the market value of gold was 32 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold, which means if you're putting silver dollars into circulation, there's only about 50 cents worth of silver in those dollars, which means the currency is worth less, which causes inflation. And I know that sounds super confusing, and it's, it's even hard to explain. So let's keep this really, really simple. When you see 16 to 1 or hear that reference when it comes to the election of 1896, just remember 16 to 1 equals inflation, which equals it's easier to pay down your debt. So it benefits debtors and farmers. Now, what other political party was in the background at this time? In fact, it was a... I mean, it wasn't a dominant political party, but it certainly had a voice. And that one, of course, was the populists. And you might recall that the populists were in favor of inflation. And so what we're going to see is that Brian is going to run on what's called a fusion ticket, where they're going to fuse the populists and the Democrats together, thinking that will give them enough support to take down the Republicans. And um, we can see this fusion in this <laughs> rather bizarre cartoon here where there's Brian, notice it says Populist Party, and he's swallowing up the Democratic Party. 
Now, let's get into that actual campaign and see who wins. So the two men had incredibly different political styles in terms of campaigning. Uh, Brian decides to go out and take his message directly to the people. He's going to travel some 18,000 miles during this campaign. He's going to stop and make speeches in 27 states, uh, again, making hundreds of speeches. And the crowd would just turn out in and, and, and droves to hear him speak. And uh, th this message of free silver or inflation became a rallying cry, almost like a religious doctrine uh, to Brian's followers. So he is whipping up the crowds here in, and, uh, in his campaign. McKinley, however, does something different. McKinley is kind of from the old school where politicians, especially presidential politicians anyways, were not really supposed to go out and do a whole lot of glad-handing and speaking. Instead, the office was supposed to seek the man, and they called it a front porch campaign. And all told, about a half a million voters would eventually come to meet McKinley on his front porch in Ohio. Obviously, not all at once. Now, what this election comes down to ultimately is can a regional issue, that is to say silver and inflation, decide a national election? Will, will people across America resonate with this call for inflation? Now, think about big business at this time. Remember, big business at this time had a lot of political clout. Are they going to favor McKinley and the gold standard or Bryan and the call for inflation? And obviously, inflation, as we said, is bad for business, so they're going to side with McKinley. You can see here, uh, again, sound money means the gold standard. And there's McKinley and his campaign advisor, Marcus Alonzo Hanna. So let's look at the results, see what happens. You can see McKinley wins um, the states that really matter, places like New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, of course, that's his home state, Illinois, you know, the big electoral numbers, they're all piling up for McKinley, which is why if you look at the popular vote, he's got far more votes than uh, his Democratic rival. Now, Brian does well in rural states because his message appealed to farmers and rural uh, people. And uh, he does pretty well, getting 47% of the popular vote. But, of course, that doesn't mean anything. As we know, the electoral vote is all that matters. And there, it's a landslide in favor of McKinley. Now, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but it turns out in 1900, these guys are going to run against each other again. So it's once again going to be McKinley versus Bryan. And McKinley is going to win again in 1900. Okay, that was a long video, I know, and we covered a lot of material about the political parties. We talked about corruption, the different scandals. We looked at um, the patronage system and civil service reform, the assassination of a president over an office seeker's uh, obsession. We looked at the election of 1896 and currency and tariffs and all kinds of stuff. So I know that's a ton of information, guys, but definitely be familiar with the big political issues of the day and uh, be aware of the importance of the election of 1896.